Uh, first thing I'd like to do is is call the meeting to order. Aaron. Here. Uh, Sean. Here. Tom. Here. Carla. Here. John. Here. And Chuck is here. Uh, <clears throat> before I get at, uh, started on the agenda, I first would like to uh, just take a few moments to thank our dear uh, loyal uh, administrative assistant Linda Engelson. This is Linda's last uh, school committee meeting. Uh, Linda's retiring uh, officially, I guess, at the end of the month, but uh, her last day is actually tomorrow. So uh, Linda, uh, we love you and we're going to miss you. I mean, you've been uh, just a, a uh, tremendous uh, asset, uh, patient, uh, loyal uh, uh, person to the school committee, and you know that that's only uh, one of the things you you do. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, we I've been uh, here since 2007, and I remember uh, Pat Scantini told me. Uh, with my first day on the job was don't get on the wrong side of Linda. So I've tried to remember that Linda. I think I've stepped over the line a few times, so I'm sorry if I did. Uh, but uh, you know, you're like uh, Radar O'Reilly for anybody's an old MASH fan. Uh, you know what what everyone's thinking and and gonna gonna be thinking uh, be, before they they say it. So again. Uh, Thank you. Thank you uh, again. We love you and we're going to miss you. So I don't know if anyone else wanted to say anything. You spoke for us all, Chuck. I think that was great. Thank you. Absolutely. OK, uh, so uh, Linda, you got to turn your camera on for one minute. Make sure <laughs> you're smiling. <laughs> uh, there she is. Uh, so uh, before we uh, go into the agenda, I there was a, uh, a couple of uh, things I want to do. Uh, uh, John Parks had a uh, request for a uh, uh, point of personal privilege. So John. Thanks, Chuck. Um, thank you for allowing me this moment of personal privilege. At the December 17th school committee meeting, RPS Director of Guidance Lynn Williams and RMHS Principal Kate Boynton presented to the school committee. They shared recent test scores, college acceptance rates, as well as sharing the changes that will be made in the RMHS handbook. Ms. Boynton discussed the changes pr proposed and, and were shared and agreed upon in the recent school council meeting and with staff at a recent staff meeting. I want to apologize for my behavior in that last meeting. In the sharing presented by Ms. Boynton and some of the questioning she received, I sat and did nothing. It was my perception that her integrity as an educator and principal were questioned repeatedly at that meeting, yet I remained silent. For that reason, I am apologizing to Principal Boynton and the entire district leadership team, as well as our educators. I was wrong for sitting in the meeting and not voicing my objection to the way that Principal Boynton was treated. While the six of us on the school committee bring different viewpoints and we each have a responsibility to ask questions prior to voting on a topic, we should at all times remain professional and supportive of the district's educational experts. We as a committee may not always agree with everything shared within the topic or presentation but we owe it to our district educators to be respectful and professional at all times. We also need to remember that there are boundaries in our roles as members of the school committee. While we may all have opinions on operational matters, in most cases, most of these decisions remain outside our purview of the school committee. As stated in the MASC operational guidelines and the Reading Public Schools School Committee operating protocols, we must rely on our district experts 
to make operational and curriculum decisions that serve the best interest of our students and to share with us the members of, and to share with us and the members of the writing public community why the decisions were made. This is why we hired these educational experts in the first place. This period of time is as difficult as any we've lived in our lifetime. In order to honor our commitment to serve our students and community, we must strive to do better as a committee and to support our district leadership team in guarding our schools through the turbulent times. I will try to remember where my boundaries are and stay within them. Again, I apologize to Principal Boynton and the entire district leadership team and to all our educators of the Red Reading Public Schools for not speaking up when I should have. Moving forward, I will continue I, I will continue to support our district leadership team and educators with the respect and professionalism they deserve. I am proud to be a small part of this all important work. Thank you, Mr. Robinson, for the time. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, and uh, I, uh, Ms. Shanklin uh, had something as well. Uh, Ricky. Hi, Ricky. Yes, hello. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ricky Shanklin, principal of the Parker Middle School, and I would like to read a statement on behalf of the principals of the Reading Public Schools. Good evening, Reading School Committee members. As building leaders in the Reading Public Schools, we are extremely proud of and thankful for the collaboration, creativity, commitment, communication, courage, and most importantly, the heart that has been poured into providing our students a rich and engaging education during these trying times. Collectively, we could not be prouder of the Reading Public School staff. We consider ourselves blessed every day to work with such dedicated, giving humans who always do best for students. We celebrate the great work happening amidst the pandemic and the silver linings that may someday soon serve as the backbone to our district. In recent school committee meetings, there have been personal attacks by members of the school committee on the integrity of administrators. Opportunities for celebrations have been dismissed or replaced with public criticism. It's unacceptable for personal attacks against any staff member or administrator to occur in such a public forum as a school committee meeting. As building administrators, we expect and welcome challenges and questions from all of our constituents as we work to be our best selves, to lead schools that best serve our students, and to work together to create a district that we are proud of. Yet we have never before felt a challenge of trust in our foundational honesty and integrity by the school committee. At this difficult time, we know that feelings and emotions are heightened and that we are all working hard to maintain our balance. As building leaders, we communicate with and treat our students, staff, and families with respect, knowing that we are all committed to the learning and well being of the children of Reading. We only ask that we be treated in the same way by the school committee. Thank you for your time and consideration of the statement from the Reading principals. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Ricky. Uh, and, you know, we appreciate your uh, and the, your collective thoughts and and appreciate all of you uh, and uh, uh, just uh, will do better. So thank you. Uh, so uh, after that, th does anyone else have anything they wanted to add? Or I raised my hand, Chuck, in the forum. I'm sorry, Tom. Yeah, go ahead. So um, I think clearly that was directed at me. So. I'll take that. Um, I I appreciate what people think they're they're doing or saying, and I appreciate that they're trying to do the best. And I think that's what we're all always trying to do. We're all always trying to do the best and always trying to get better. Um, you know, I. I've watched that that sh that um, meeting three or four times now on YouTube. Um, after having a few people uh, reach out, I had a few people reach out and thank me. I had a few people reach out and challenge me, right? And in our roles, those things happen. Um, I watched it multiple times, as I mentioned. I never once raised my voice. I regularly and frequently called it a miscommunication, a misunderstanding. I think in addition to supporting 
our administration, which we have to do and we do do on a regular basis. We also have to support our parents and our families. Um, and I think it was a miscommunication around what happened in the meeting that preceded our meeting. Um, there's still some misunderstanding that's out there right now. Mr. Robinson and I had a few conversations because Lynn had met, reached out to try and talk with us right before the holidays, and we're still trying to schedule that. That has not happened. Um, so that's still pending. Uh, I'd be happy to sit down with, with Kate and go through that as well, Mrs. Boynton. There was never an intent to attack or impugn integrity. There are still many questions about that meeting. Um, not ours, but the school council meeting. Uh, and the role of school council and the role of parents. And I think the role of parents needs to also be recognized and supported appropriately. Um, in no way, shape or form was I trying to attack Kate or Lena. I do think um, when people say we're, we should avoid operational matters, we also need to understand that the student handbook is probably the second most important policy document that we have. It is a policy document. It is not an operational document. It's filled with policy. Uh, ultimately, it is a policy document, and that is our that is our our lane. That is what we're supposed to do. Um, so, I I'm sorry that people saw it as an attack. Um, in the moment, it seemed uh, it seemed contentious, um, but I think there were also many portions of the conversation where the contentiousness wasn't there when we moved past things and moved on. Um, but I do still think there was a misunderstanding. Uh, there is still a misunderstanding, and I know that certain members of the community are trying to close that misunderstanding. I apologize, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry people viewed that as an attack on the administration in any way, shape or form. It was uh, trying to make sure that clarity was happening and things were happening in the way that supports open meeting law, The the rules that we're bound by, the policy role that we have, and make sure we're on the same page and understanding. So uh, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Tom. OK, uh, for the uh, remainder of the agenda, we'll, we'll start with uh, a uh, uh, just I'll comment that public comment. Uh, it can be. Uh, done through sending a message to the chat function. Um, the if it's something we're discussing, then we'll try to address it. Then uh, if it's, it's not something on the agenda, we'll uh, read it at the end of the meeting. Uh, it follow, uh, so that's public comment and, and uh, then we'll have the we'll quickly vote on the consent agenda. Uh, and then we'll have reports and go into the uh, budget discussion uh, and ending with a uh, winter hybrid update. So uh, is there a motion on the consent agenda? Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Second. Any discussion? I have one minor question. Um, Dr. Doherty or, or Ms. Dowd, whoever the right person is to answer it. The donation that we received, is that a company that, that services the grounds of our schools? It, it seems like it from the letter, but I'm not 100% sure if that's the case. That would be Loiters. Yes. No. No, they don't service us no, at all. They're just given donations for years. OK. OK, thank you. I wasn't sure if they were servicing our grounds or not, but it's great that companies decide to give back to public schools like that. Yeah, this this comes in quite frequently, Tom, but they're they're not one of our regular maintenance providers. OK, uh, seeing uh, no other uh, questions, comments, uh, Aaron. Aye. Uh, Sean. Aye. Tom. Aye. Aaron, I mean, uh, Carla. Aye. And John. Aye. Chuck, aye. OK, uh, now we'll uh, do reports. Uh, is Bridget here tonight? OK, uh, so we'll have uh, John. Were we going to keep staff staff report? Were there any or was it just going to be the budget? 
Yeah, there are no staff reports tonight, Chuck. OK, uh, Tom, did you have any report? I have no report, sir. No, Sean. Not tonight, thank you. Uh, Aaron. No report tonight, Chuck. Uh, John. No report, Chuck. And Carla. No report tonight, thank you. And I don't have a report. Uh, Dr. Darty, did, did we, uh, Gail, did we want to uh, go into the budget now? Sure, I'm going to start and then I'm going to hand the uh, baton over to Gail. Um, and, uh, before you, I'm sorry, John, before you do, I didn't uh, uh, recognize who, who else is here for the budget. Uh, is it just Gail and, and you and Chris and and Jen, or is there, I, I didn't see all Mary, the invites. Mary Juliana is here. Oh, Mary, directly. yes. Uh, Julian Carr, our network manager. Julian. Yep. Okay. And, and Carrie. Joe. And Joe Huggins, yes. Joe Huggins Joe. for facilities. Okay. I think, believe Kerry is. Kerry is oh, yeah. so, there. Yep. I apologize, everybody. So, okay, John. Sorry. No, it's okay. I'm assuming you can see that. Yes. Yes. Great. So thank you, everyone. Um, this is uh, the time of year that that we focus on uh, developing a proposed uh, recommended budget for the FY22 year. Um, before I begin, I just want to put out a thank you for all of the administrators, uh, principals, directors, central office administrators who uh, helped contribute to this um budget document that we released yesterday i especially want to thank gail dowd for and her team for the work that she did on this budget and the team did their team did on this budget um what you see here in in the the numbers and the slides and the budget book is a result of um gail's leadership in in moving this forward so i really appreciate um her time and effort over the last uh, several weeks. So first we want to talk about the um, budget presentation calendar. Uh, the budget was released last night uh, to the school committee and the community. Um, it is online uh, as well as it was sent last night to all families uh, via Blackboard Connect and it was also put on our, uh, our Reading Public School blog. We will start this evening with a brief overview and then I'm going to turn it over to Gail who's going to do the administration, district-wide services, um, cost centers, and then her and Joe Huggins will be uh, doing the school facilities and capital uh, areas of the, of the budget. Next Thursday, we will be doing the regular day and special education budgets. Um, that'll be Chris Kelly and Dr. Stice. Uh, we will have the public hearing and discussion on the 21st that it was posted today in the paper and the school committee is scheduled to take a vote on the 25th. So that's the that's the calendar of events. Um, we also want to thank our finance committee members for being here and being a part of this process um, as well. So first, as we always do when we're putting together the budget, we want to make sure it is connected to the goals um, in the direction of our district. And so that would be our district improvement plan um, and the superintendent's goals. So what I'm just gonna outline is kind of like a 30,000 foot level of some of the things that are in the budget that connect to the different areas of our district improvement plan. So one of our major areas is obviously what we're going through this year um, with building that foundation of teaching and learning practices, all the infrastructure changes we're making, the assessments and all of the operation efficiencies so that we're preparing our schools for not only the current conditions that we're in, but also future challenges in a post pandemic world. So in the budget, you are going to see um, built in uh, in the recommended budget, some of the remote learning tools that we are currently using. Uh, for online learning, the Zoom license renewal. 
We do have funding for extraordinary fiber optic repairs, uh, technology license renewals, and some additional malware protection for internet service. That is uh, all under this area. Another area is evaluating refining standards based instructional systems. This is with the curriculum and instruction area. So in addition to having professional development and training in the FY22 budget, uh, we also have funding for a grade six math curriculum in, an ele uh, in the beginnings of the elementary math curriculum program, and also uh, some additional social studies curriculum material at the elementary level. We've been uh, working on social studies. This will be next year will be the third year. Another area is reviewing our equity and social justice practices, analyzing student social emotional growth and refining systems of support to ensure a healthy and successful learning community while meeting the unique needs of students. So in here in the budget is built in professional development and training uh, to help address those areas. One of the superintendent's goals this year is to develop and implement a talent diversification and leadership development strategy. Uh, as as you know, we recently hired Kerry Meisinger, who is our human resource director. Um, so we upgraded this position uh, to a human resource director this year, and you'll see that reflected moving forward in the FY22 budget. Uh, in addition to that, uh, one of the major goals is um, starting that talent diversification and leadership development strategy, which Kerry will be leading. Another area that's a superintendent's goal is to improve the literacy evaluation process, enhancing our reading instructional strategies and structure our progress monitoring more effectively for students who are struggling readers. You will see uh, a request for a new position, which is for a special education literacy coach, uh, which we will go in much more detail in next week's <coughs> presentation. There is also professional development that is gonna be in the FY22 recommended budget for literacy training and an elementary literacy assessment. And then finally, uh, the final goal and uh, superintendent goal is to improve the physical and psychological safety of our students. Um, this is really looking at the physical plant and continuing to improve the safety areas. Um, so there is continued work going on with security infrastructure, which is in our capital uh, plan and continuing our cleaning contract services, which is in that budget proposal. So I am now going to turn it over to uh, Gail, and she's going to talk about the financial. Great, thank you, John. I will I be. be... Oh, it's not me having the echo. No. Um, I will be going through the slides, but I'll also be referring to the budget book that hopefully everyone has received. So I will be going between the two. I'll reference the page numbers that might have more detail for folks. The first slide that we wanted to show is a high level reconciliation. We realized that last year and this year there have been a lot of various one time expenses related to COVID. So what we have done for the FY22 budget is to level set the budget. And what we mean by that is removing all of the one time COVID related funding that we received. So we've done a high level reconciliation here that takes the final FY21 budget as it was approved and amended through town meeting up until November compared it to the FY22 budget. And the reason we're showing those numbers is that what will is what actually ties to all of the public documents with our funding. If you look at it that high level, we have a 2.59% increase. What is more important to look at is what the budget looks like removing the one-time COVID funding that we received. Within the FY21 budget, there was $180,000 approved that is all sitting within the facilities budget. If we remove that, we updated what the FY21 budget would have looked like without that. And that shows that we would have a 3.2% operating budget increase and an overall increase of 
we will highlight these items as we go through. We just felt it was important to let the committee know that those expenses, the 180,000 was not carried forward into the operating budget and it's not part of our growth rate going forward. The plan that we have is as we proceed through the year, if it appears that there will be additional ongoing expenses related to COVID that will impact FY22, we will work closely with the town manager as well as finance committee to address the best source of funding for that. The next chart is a chart we historically have shown to folks, and this is one that breaks down high level the five cost centers that we will be discussing. And as we talked about in December, the school committee ultimately will be asked to vote on each of the five cost centers. Again, what we've done here is highlight that the 180,000 is included within the school facilities budget. We'll go into that in more detail. If we exclude the one time COVID expenses, the facilities budget would have increased by approximately 4.2%. As we historically have done, what we like to do is start at a high level and just give a quick overview about the process we take when we start to build the budget. We, I refer to it almost as a bottoms up budget where we do look through all items when we're meeting with all of the various building principals, administrators throughout the district. One of the items that we incorporate is funding for all of our contractual step and COLA increases for our represented and not represent and non represented employees. We are highlighting that as a reminder, we are in the final year of our collective bargaining agreements with all five of our unions. We will be starting negotiating those contracts in the upcoming months. We also take a look at Dr. Stice and I spend a considerable amount of time looking at all of our known out of district tuition and transportation. We take a look at that population. We look at any potentials we may know and any placeholders for students that we're currently assessing. And we look at various if there are known increases in rates or potential changes in placements. We are fortunate that we do know the cost of the transportation because we utilize NRT through a SEAM contract and we have a zero base budget for next year, which is nice for the transportation. We also worked very closely with Chris Kelly and her team to look at all of the various curriculum materials, and we have a baseline budget for various grade six math curriculum materials, social study curriculum materials, and some initial funding for elementary math curriculum materials. That's an ongoing process that we do throughout the year, and we're constantly reassessing the items in the tool so we don't definitively have items earmarked yet, but those are our focus areas as we built the budget. We also, as we've discussed, we had a lot of various grant funding in the past year. We also worked very closely with Chris and her team to go through the remote learning curriculum material and tools and make assessments as to which pieces we felt would continue into the upcoming year. Again, we are continuing to look at the various utilization reports as well as talking to all of the constituents to de fully determine which ones will go forward, but we have made a preliminary assessment and have included those within the grant. We also have, as John mentioned, funding for a literacy, literacy assessment for elementary students. The other area that we have put an anticipated placeholder is for our regular day transportation, which includes our mandated transportation, athletics and extracurricular. We are in the final year of a five year bus contract and we will begin negotiating a new contract in the spring. We do anticipate with the challenges that we have encompassed with COVID that it could be a very volatile environment and we do not have a full sense yet where the pricing for that will come in. We also like to point out one of 
as you know, one of the biggest drivers in our budget is our personnel. So we also like to highlight any areas in which we are adding or reducing staff. This year it is very minimal for us. We are proposing to add a special education literacy coach within the special education cost center that I know Dr. Stice will talk about next week during her presentation. Within the current year, we did have a couple of positions that we increased the FTE allocation for, and one of them is a 0.3 FTE increase for an elementary specialist. We worked very closely with the elementary principals looking at their schedules, trying to maximize the specialists as best we could and also um, provide as much support to the students. This model that we are using this year has been received very favorably, so we are planning to continue that into next year. We also worked very closely with the middle schools. So we had a nominal, very minimal increase of 0.1 in their PE health position that has also improved their scheduling at the middle school. Um, it actually is at the Parker Middle School, so we're very happy that we're able to continue that for Ricky. The one area that we do have a reduction, as you know, we look at our class sizes every year. We do have a fifth grade bubble class that is moving into the sixth grade. As a result, we are reducing a 1.0 elementary teacher. The other area that we spend a lot of time with, I will say the revolving accounts, as you can recall from the end of last year and beginning of this year, have been an area we have been focusing on. They have been a little bit of a challenge with the pandemic. We, the approach we are taking is we are looking to reset the offsets with the assumption that we will be returning back to normal times. So as you'll recall, we did reduce some of the offsets this year due to decreases in enrollment and participation. With our full day kindergarten, we are recommending a $50,000 increase and that is based upon our preliminary enrollment. That was based upon, I've worked with Linda, who I, I do have to say, I, I'm still sad that tomorrow's our last day. Definitely going to miss her terribly. Um, we worked closely when she was receiving all of the applications for full day K. We are recommending an increase in the offset based upon what we've seen to date. We are also recommending an increase in our rise offset. That is one of the accounts which actually has remained relatively stable with the population of students participating in there. The other proposed increase is within extracurricula, and that is specifically tied to the two middle schools. The past couple of years, we have proposed offsets for them. Last year, we felt we were in a very good position to be able to take the offsets, but then when the pandemic happened and we ended up having to cancel shows and, and not have the shows we had anticipated, we did not take them last year. We do feel that next year, if things return to normal, we should be able to do that. The one area that we are looking closely at is our facilities rentals. We have not had any rentals since March 13th when everything was shut down. Even within the current year, we have had very minimal rentals. We do not have the typical recreation activities, so we don't have the recreation fees coming through and all of our larger indoor rentals are not happening as we are currently not renting out our indoor space. So we are paying particular attention to that. Over the past month, I've been working very closely with our direct, so Chris, um, Chris Nelson, the director of Extended Day and Adult Education, we are doing a deep dive into the Extended Day revolving account reviewing all of the current expenses and current revenue based upon enrollment and looking at what we anticipate next year's enrollment and expenses are so that we can reassess not only their offsets but their fee structure as well. You'll remember about three, four years ago, we did propose a reduction in the fees for extended day, so we are revisiting that. We are also looking at all of our other revolving accounts, so we do plan to come back in the spring with a much more 
detailed analysis. Again, it's been slightly more complicated given all of the closures and changes that we are seeing within each of these programs. We also at this point do not have a sense of what next year's free and reduced may look like because as we've discussed this year, the free and reduced process is not quite the same as all of the meals being served in schools as well as our uh, distributions we're doing twice a week are all free of charge to families. So we also do not have a sense yet of what that may look like, but we will be coming back to the committee with updates on each revolving account as we complete an analysis. As we typically like to point out to the committee that we do start this process early. We are we just completed our fourth month of the school year, which is not a typical school year. So a lot of our trends and expenses aren't happening the way we normally would see them. So we're taking. What we know to have happened last year, what's happening this year, four months in and projecting out the next 18 months. So there is a lot of uncertainty and also not knowing where things will be in September of next year. So there could be unanticipated costs with increases in student enrollment. We did assume that our enrollment would go back to historical levels in all of the assumptions we're using. We have assumptions on current homeless students, English language learning students. We also have assumptions in there with our special ed related to any consultation, compensatory, out of district transportation and tuition. Again, a lot can change between now and the end of this year as well as into next year. And we constantly monitor those and provide updates to the committee as the year progresses. In addition, as we mentioned earlier, this budget does assume that we are past the COVID-19 pandemic and we are returning back to normalized expenses. So we have not carried forward any of the PPE or extra cleaning that we incurred in the current year. In addition, a lot of the staffing changes we made this year, those are not being carried forward either, except for the couple of positions we mentioned briefly a moment ago. This chart just shows the percentage of each cost center to the total budget. As you can see, regular day continues to be the largest at 57.4 with special ed second at 32.9. These percentages do shift slightly year to year. You will see this year there is um, this is the first year in a couple of years in which special education has not increased and regular ed decreasing. We will go into more detail of that when next week when Dr. Stice and I cover special ed. A lot of that has to do with. We do have increases within our circuit breaker funding, which it has helped us with our overall out of district tuition and transportation. This chart shows the change in cost center budgets year over year, and as you can tell, there are certain years in which cost centers spike up and some of the smaller cost centers tend to stay stable year over year, but we will dive into each of these cost centers over the next few evenings to give everyone more color on what's going on in each of them. This next chart is a snapshot of the entire budget by category. We will go through each category as we dive into the cost centers, but just to give folks a quick reminder of what each of them are and obviously we can cover this again as we go through it but just to for folks who might be new to the process professional salaries includes all of our administrators department directors teachers and specialists the clerical salary line includes the central office staff as well as building based secretaries the other salaries line includes support staff, which would be paras, custodians, and substitutes. The contract services includes legal fees, transportation, as well as our outside cleaning company. Supplies and materials includes curriculum materials, technology, classroom supplies, as well as software. Other expenses includes out-of-district tuition, 
postage, dues, memberships, as well as professional development. And again, we do have the reminder on the bottom that the FY21 budget does include the $180,000 of the one-time COVID expenses. That all is sitting within supplies and materials. So if we backed out the one-time COVID expenses, that line item would have increased by 10.6% over all cost centers. I will take a pause there. That really is meant to be a high level overview before we dive into specific cost centers. If people have any generic questions that they would like to ask, I would say that any specific cost center questions we'll address as we hit the cost centers. If folks wanted to maybe give us a chance to cover the cost center first. Uh, Sean, thank you, Gail. Nope, never mind. Gail just told me to wait. <laughs> I'm here for you, Sean. <laughs> I'm happy to answer them, but I'm not sure if it would be covered in, in the presentation. So whichever way you prefer. No, I, 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 w I wanted to make a comment about the literacy coach, um, but I'll wait till we get there. Okay. Thanks. OK, it looks like you can jump in, Gail. Great. Thank you. The first, so tonight, we will be covering what I'm going to call the three smaller cost centers. So we'll go through administration, district-wide programs, and facilities, just so folks know what we'll be covering. The first cost center that we're going to cover is the administration cost center. And this information as well is within the budget book if, if folks wanted to follow along. This does start on my printout page 22. I realize sometimes pagination may change depending um, on your printer. This budget is $1,261,467, so a relatively small cost center overall. There is a $59,000 increase or just under 5%, 4.9. This, how we built this budget is it does include cost of living adjustments for the central office administrators and staff. What we do wanna remind folks is that these are all placeholders as of right now. The final determination of salaries for next year typically happens within the June timeframe. As you are aware, um, we are in the process of the search for the superintendent. There is a placeholder in the budget for that that was determined based upon discussions with the school committee as we were going through the budget development process. That salary will be determined once the new superintendent is selected and a contract is determined. As we've also mentioned within the year, which we are, I'm incredibly excited for that we did bring Carrie on as our new human resources director. We did make a very conscious decision to upgrade this position from the human resources administrator to the human resources director. And all of that is reflected within this cost center as well. We have changes in the salary structure as well as adjustments to some of the professional development and membership lines to make sure we are supporting this position. We also made a very minimal decrease within the Labor Council services. We do anticipate that the bulk of the negotiations for our five collective bargaining agreements will be completed this year. We are also optimistic that with bringing Kerry on board, we will be able to utilize her skill set and potentially limit some of the calls that historically we have been sending to outside counsel. So again, a small decrease in that line item as we wrap up negotiations and um, fully onboard carry into the district. <clears throat> this next chart shows by area what the changes are to each of the various categories. As we just discussed, professional salaries, that represents the upgrade of the HR administrator to the HR director position. Within clerical salaries, this is where this always is fun to start to explain. The FY21 budget reflects the budget based upon the personnel we knew at the time. So 18 months, two years ago, we were building this budget. Um, we have had 
it feels like 10 years. We have had various changes within the central office personnel. So if we bring somebody in potentially at a lower salary than the person going out, it's reflected in the FY22 budget, not the FY21 budget. So I don't want anyone to see that and think that we are cutting hours, cutting staff or cutting salaries. It's a reflection of the current staff and their salaries built out. Um, contract services. There is a one time item within the FY21 budget related to the superintendent search that we do not anticipate recurring next year. So that's the decrease you see there. And then within other expenses, that is where our professional development, dues and memberships are within that line item. We have increased a couple of items within there. Some of it is related to the HR position. Others are related to the superintendent position. We did put placeholders in there knowing there may be additional, whether it be <clears throat> tuition reimbursement, getting mentors. So we have built in additional expenses within that line item as well, knowing that next year there will be a new superintendent. <clears throat> From a staffing standpoint, the staffing is flat. We have no proposals in here. As you will recall, we were very thankful. So I do have to thank again the committee as well as finance committee for supporting the HR payroll administrator position that was added as part of this year's budget. That has been beyond instrumental, especially in the current year with all of the various COVID leaves, unemployment fraud. We this position has been incredibly beneficial to us. So um, thank you again for everyone's support in the 21 budget process associated with that. What we also do is we do have additional detail. It becomes an eye chart if we try to make it a slide. It is on page 23 of your budget book that does show a little bit more detail of each of the line items that comprise the main categories. We did touch on pretty much all of them. You can see that the administrative salaries are relatively flat. The director increased, that's the HR position that we talked about. Consulting services, we did have the search. That was a one-time expense. I will say that we have bumped up the audit fees that historically has been around a $10,000 item. We are 100% anticipating increased audits next year, all related to the various federal funding we are receiving. We have been notified by DESE that all of the various COVID grants that we receive will be fully audited. So we have built in an assumed increase associated with those because since they are school related grants, the schools will bear the cost of the audits. The rest of the items are relatively minimal. Again, we did increase professional development and that is to support the new HR director as well as the new superintendent. And we did have a slight increase in the software licensing in support. We did have a few enhancements to our recruiting tools and we're all we also signed on for a technology tool that will help the HR department in allowing automated signatures especially now where we are more remote this took care of us having to pass paper back and forth so that is a new software tool that we launched in the current year I will okay, take thank a pause. You. Thank you, Gail. Uh, it was great. Uh, an answered a lot of my questions without the took away my thunder. <laughs> I'm getting uh, Shauna, better at it, Chuck. Shauna, you uh, you all set or you have you want to ask that now? No, I'm good for now. OK, Chuck, there was one uh, Q&A question related to budget from the first section that I missed getting in on time for. If you want to take it now. Uh, sure. Uh, so Jeffrey Corum, Ridge Road. Regarding enrollment numbers, do we expect a bubble in K enrollment? Because if I recall correctly, a number of families held their children out this year. 
regarding I can start if John, you can jump in if I go. We built that in. We do anticipate the kindergarten numbers to return back to what they historically had been. Um, so we have factored that in. If we had not, we might have actually had a decrease in kindergarten teachers and paras based upon where the numbers were and not needing the remote teacher, but we are holding the staffing consistent and we do anticipate the numbers to be back to where they were historically. Perfect answer. Thank you. Any other uh, questions from the committee or, or or the FinCom as well? Marianne and Ed, do you have, if you have anything. No, I'm all set. Me, my point. Thank you. OK, great. So the next area that we will move into are what we bundle into district wide programs that is comprised of health services, extracurricular athletics and district wide networking and technology maintenance. I do know Julian is here to correct me if I go astray with any of his technology changes. I do want to take one quick moment and say that in the middle of everything else that is going on, I appreciate all of the time that everyone involved in these cost centers has spent. We've had multiple meetings developing the budgets um, and I do want to, I know we do this every meeting, but acknowledge Mary and her staff for all of the support they are giving us. I definitely think they are some of the unsung heroes right now. So I appreciate everything Mary has done um, to go above and beyond what we typically ask of that group to do. So within this budget, the combination of the four areas are is $2.1 million. It has an increase of 87,000, which is about a 4.3% increase. Similar to all of our other cost centers, we do have funding for cost of living adjustments, step, salary steps and columns. This would be for our nurses, athletic coaches, advisory stipends that are within the extracurricular realm, as well as the athletic secretary. As we mentioned, all five cost centers are all five bargaining units are ending this year and we're currently in the process of negotiating it for all of for the rest of the group, which would be the district network manager, our technicians. Shout out to Andy, who's been doing a great job with all of our various remote meetings. Um, we have cost of living adjustments in there for them, as well as our director of nurses. One of the areas that we do anticipate increases in is within the transportation. As we mentioned earlier, we are in the final year of a five year contract, so we are going to start negotiating. We're working on the documentation now. The transportation market is very volatile, so we have put an assumed increase in there as, and we will keep the committee apprised as we go through the bidding process. We also have built in anticipated increase, increases for facilities rentals and for us that is for ice hockey as well as swimming. As you can imagine, we are just in the beginning phases of hockey. Swimming has been pushed out to future seasons of athletics for the current year. So we actually do not have set definitive rates for this year. So we built in an assumed increase for next year, not knowing what this year or next year will look like, which is the typical process we usually follow. Within this cost center, we have also taken a very hard look at our technology spend. It is an area we kick the tires every year. We are adding a little over $28,000 for added malware protection for our Verizon Fios internet service. As you can imagine, there's been a lot more publicity about network security, protection of student data privacy, especially in this remote world. So we are making sure we are taking the steps necessary for that. We are also adding funding for extraordinary repairs related to our fiber optics. 
we did this a couple of years ago related to the clocks and bells and paging systems. We actually, over the course of the last four months, have had two major network outages that has required us to bring in outside help to fix. We do feel it would be very prudent to put money in the budget to cover these going forward. And these are due to natural environmental causes um, and woodland and woodland creatures. <laughs> We're just going to say woodland creatures. Um, one fared very well, one did not fare very well. Um, so we're going to just the poor squirrel. Um, but it is a costly issue, but it's also an issue we need to rectify immediately because when this happens, um, it, it causes major disruptions to the buildings. We also each year, as we've mentioned in one of the items we're going to work on for a future presentation or perhaps as part of the question and answers is what our renewal life cycle is. So as we've discussed, this cost center fluctuates depending upon which contracts are up for renewal. Oftentimes these are tied to capital projects where we may be able to have a three year agreement at the time we do the capital and then we build out the budget for when those items are going to be coming up for renewal. We also, as we mentioned earlier, are looking to increase the offsets for the two middle school revolving accounts. To date, we have not actually been taking offsets from those, but we've had discussions with both building principals and this is something that we are looking to incorporate and then we will be adjusting them each year depending upon what the shows are and what the various receipts will be. We continue to monitor both the extracurricular and the athletic revolving accounts to take into account what is currently going on in the environment. This next slide shows high level what each of the various di district wide programs budgets are going up. Health services is level funded, but we will go into the detail as to how it became level funded in one of the next slides. Athletics is up slightly 4.63%. Extracurricular has a decrease, but that decrease is directly tied to the change in the offsets for the revolving accounts. And technology is up just over 11%, mainly tied to the couple of items we just discussed. What we're going to do next is go into each of these cost centers into a little bit more detail. And if people do want to follow along, the health services is on page 43 of your budget book. But just to go through the professional services, this is the decrease is not tied to any reduction in staffing. Again, this is a situation where we had turnover within the nurses. We had a couple of um, nurses who left at the end of last year and the individuals coming in were, pla were placed differently on the salary scale based upon their levels of experience. So oftentimes this could be a top step individual who had been here for many, many years, which was the case with the, the nurse at the high school who was replaced with somebody a little bit more junior. So that is why next year's budget looks like a decrease is because the actual salaries for the current year are significantly lower. We have um, the clerical salaries that is a portion of Lori Miller's salary. Uh, I believe 25% of her salary is allocated to this cost center based upon the time and effort she puts in assisting this cost center. Other salaries, that is our substitute line. We have been slowly increasing that line as we have seen an increased need for our nurse substitutes, whether it be for various screenings, testings, field trips. We also are not certain yet what the rollout of any potential vaccine might be. And if our, I will say our nurses have, are phenomenal. They have all volunteered to assist with this program. I believe they're going to be going to training soon to get trained on the vaccine. 
depending what the rollout of that vaccination process does look like, we wanted to make sure we were in a position where we could free up the nurses to assist with whether it's staff, students, vaccinations. The rest of the items are all relatively flat within F, um, so that's how we get to the level funded budget. Within athletics, we have the professional salaries, which is a portion of the athletics director. So Tom, a portion of Tom Zaya's salary is in there. The clerical sec salaries is the secretary. Other salaries is comprised of the coach salaries as well as the offset. Again, we are not cutting any coaches. That is a function of depending what step and level the current coaches are at. We have had changeover within the coaching staff, so we have brought that forward into next year, assuming it's the same group of coaches. Within the contract services, that includes equipment repairs, field maintenance, facilities, rentals, and transportation. The majority of the field maintenance now resides within the town core budget. What's left in this is mainly minimal field maintenance. A lot of it is the line painting. The equipment repairs is oftentimes for the football uniforms, helmets, shoulder pads. The facilities, rentals, and transportations, we talked about that we do have assumed increases built into there. Um, the other expenses, we had a slight decrease. We were, um, a lot of that is a reallocation of expenses, but we also were able to negotiate a decrease, a one-time decrease for next year related to the huddle software that we have. A lot of that was based upon what we've experienced for changes in last year, as well as this year within the athletics, we were able to negotiate a reduction for next year. I do anticipate that going back up a year from now, but happy to report we were able to get a one year reprieve. Within extracurricula, the professional salaries, the decrease in there is tied to the increase in the offsets that we had talked about. The rest of the items in there are all pretty much level funded. We've moved a couple of items around based upon what historical spend has been. Within the last cost and the last program within this cost center is the technology. We do see a slight increase in this cost center. Professional salaries and other salaries are based upon the existing staff and assumed increases for it next year. Within contract services, that is where we see our network management support and maintenance. Our Blackboard notification system is included within there. Our annual maintenance of clocks and bells, again, that tends to be we fix them when they break, but as you can imagine, as I find out quite frequently, the bell system is very critical in all of the schools and when it is not working, it does wreak havoc. We have also added $10,000 in this line item for the fiber network maintenance due to unexpected repairs, which as we mentioned, we have had two in the first four months of this year alone. We are also adding malware protection for our Fios internet service that we talked about briefly as well. And the other area is within other expenses and that does include our renewals. I believe next year it is our Fortigate or Julian will remind me which one is in there yes. that we're working. Did I get it right? Nice. The um, antivirus. Uh, antivirus. The service, yeah. So that one we did renew three years ago, so it is up. And as I mentioned, Julian and I will work on a summary that we will present to school committee so you can, similar to what you, we've talked about with some of the other areas, the curriculum life cycle and other areas, we actually do have a technology life cycle. So we will be able to indicate to you what years some of our more significant technology renewal cycles will be. And from a staffing standpoint, there are no proposed changes within the FTEs for the district-wide programs. 
And then as I mentioned, as I was going through, here are the pages that the detail of each of these programs is within the budget book that has a little bit more breakdown of the items. Gail, uh, thank you. I have a question on the transportation. Yep. Uh, is that is that done by the collab? Who does the negotiating? The collaboratives or, or us? It would actually that? it would actually be us, Chuck. So for the special education, it's the collaborative. We right. have my, my mistake, yeah. right? Regular uh, ed is on us. It's a separate separate contract. So we will be negotiating that. So in terms of the uh, or do we collect do we uh, regionalize any of that negotiation or is it all done on a town by town basis because of different schedules and stuff yeah. it's done on a town by town basis and a lot of that is tied to the timing of the contracts the type of contracts different districts handle transportation differently we do mandated transportation only with the one paid for bus to the extent we have time others have much broader transportation that they do based upon how their schools are set up so this is not one that has been regionalized right so is the you mentioned uh you know the the difficulty in that market and the uh one of those being because of covid uh and i could see where you would maintain even after the vaccine's been rolled out and stuff you would maintain a cleaning schedule and stuff but what what other covid issues would the bus company have because i don't think you'd you'd a the, year from now you might not have to social distance as much as you did the COVID related issues are going to be much more in how they structure the contracts and what the wordings are going to be. So last year and this year we all worked very collaboratively. Um, we pretty much had each group work together with their their vendors. A lot of it's going to be language check. So nobody anticipated a global COVID-19 pandemic when we did our bus contracts. So the way they were worded, the way they were structured, guaranteed payments, what happens in a shutdown, I right. anticipate that being complicated. We also know some of the players that are out there, there's been a lot of consolidation in mergers within the transportation arena. So the number of people competing is shrinking drastically. So when I say volatility, it's the amount of competition, the number of people who want to bid on it, as well as how they want to structure it so that my sense is both sides will want to protect themselves for any future pandemic situations. And it's how you work through the guaranteed payment piece of it. So, you know, I know we don't uh, with the regional, I mean, excuse me, with the neighborhood school uh, concept, we don't bus students like other towns do and as you know some of those towns actually have fleets that yep. they they keep have we ever uh looked at and not not for tonight obviously but have we ever looked at what the cost would be uh in having our own small fleet i guess compared to what we're paying out every year to the to the uh bus companies? I have not looked into that. I do know. Obviously, we have the Metco piece as well, so how that would factor into it. We do bus. There are two buses for that. Um, I have not. I do know there there's a whole different set of complexities with that from a staffing and maintenance of the fleet, and it would yeah. be a relatively small fleet. It is it probably not something we would be able to do for this upcoming contract oh, given no, the lead absolutely. time but it is something we could look at for a future it would be a, a capital outlay to purchase and or lease the buses yeah, just i'm just curious because it, it at some point uh you know it's like you know in insurance it i which i deal with you know at some point you say 
why I'm going to self insure. You know, it's the same if if the transportation companies just keep knowing they have you over a barrel, just keep raising their prices. You know that it gets to the point where you start to think, well, maybe if I brought this in house, it just a, it's a it's just a, a long term view. That's mm -hmm. all. Very valid point, Chuck. Uh, uh, John Parks. Yeah, I know we were able to do band and I believe football last year for uniforms. Do we yeah. know where we are in the cycle as far as what uniforms we're going to be looking to replace in the upcoming year? We actually, as part of it, which I can, I don't have it right handy. When Tom Zayer and I went through this, we did look at it to say, I don't remember if it was potentially baseball, but we also band and football were the two large ones last year. We always do swimming. I think we did cross country and track last year as well. So we were able to get some of the smaller ones. We did look at what we have this year and we are looking to say, how do we split some of the others? So based upon the great feedback we got last year as part of this process, Tom Zayer and I have started to build out that in inventory look at the age of everything and look at what makes sense to cycle it through. And we're looking at that as we build the okay, budget. Are we, are, is the committee going to get a, a copy of how that's from year by year and that way we can kind of forecast out? Yep. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other uh, committee questions or or from the finance committee? Okay. Ready to move on, I guess. I believe yep. um, I, is there a chat? I no, I uh, just want to, because Mr. Zaya just texted me. It's baseball and softball. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I had the baseball right. I should have known there was a softball. So <laughs> thank you, Tom. I had one of the two. I had a 50 50 chance. So I think the next section um, facilities. I think is facilities. I think Joe is here and we were going to have Joe start and then I can fill in as needed. Hi, Joe. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me tonight. So we're going to give you guys a quick overview of the facilities department, school facilities. <clears throat> This first slide here just shows you the buildings. This is something we show every year, the school buildings and the town buildings that we take care of, the 17 locations. We take care of about a million, 1.1 million square feet of space. Um, this slide just shows everybody the, you know, the age of the building, the last renovation, how many square feet um, within the town of Reading. We have a staff of, I'm sorry, you can just go back one second, John. My, my fault, sorry. That's okay. Um, we do that all down here with um, in the core facilities uh, staff with um, a staff of four maintenance men with a lot of outsourced labor for different contracts um, to maintain the school buildings uh, within the town of Reading. So this next slide is something we show you folks every year. This just gives you a comparison of the uh, work orders year over year. Uh, as you can see, we did um, just 43 more work orders this year than we did last year, even with COVID going on. Um, again, with this, the, a lot of it's dictated by the square footage. As you can see, like the high school always goes right out in the front because of the size of the building. It's the single largest building in the town of Reading. Um, it ebbs and flows at certain locations. Some, some years we do more, some years we do less. We try to minimize emergency repairs by doing a good preventive maintenance program. Uh, this next chart here, this is just to show folks um, that we actually did more um, in-house work this year. And a lot of that has to do with, uh, it was an increase of 6%. Um, a lot of the, during the shutdown in the very beginning stages of it, we were, weren't allowing a lot of people in the building. So we brought a lot of that work inside with our own guys. And we did a lot of the, we did all of the, um, the COVID Lexan shields in all of the school and town buildings. That was a big project we completed. So 
Uh, as Gail had mentioned earlier, um, the recommended budget is 1.478 million. Um, it's actually a decrease of seven and a half percent. That's reflected due to the $180,000 one-time COVID uh, money that was um, given to us uh, at town meeting. Um, the overall increase without that money would be 4.2 percent, and that's brought uh, brought on by cost of living adjustments um, and custodial supplies. So this slide just gives you an idea where we sit on the different lines. There's been no staffing changes in the facilities department. We've had some retirements this past year. We are at full staff again. Um, just gives you an idea. We have one district administrator and um, 19 and a half uh, total people in the department on the school facility side. And again, if you want to look at the detail, you can go to page 51, like Gail had mentioned earlier. Thank you, Joe. Is there uh, There's uh, some capital I think we want to talk about coming up, correct, John? Or is that? Yeah, we're going to do the capital piece first and then take questions. Chuck, got if it. that's good. Yep, got it. Thank you. So, um, on the uh, for FY uh, 21, um, the Coolidge Middle School, there's a hot water heater in there, and as well as the Parker um, Middle School for a total of $50,000 in um, HVAC work that we're doing. I don't know if you want to talk about the um, the technology stuff, Gail. Yep, I can quickly jump in for that. So each year we go through the we're cycling through our phone replacement so we are going through each of the schools for that um, this year and next year i think are our last two chunks of funding for that this year we have we are going through a project planning process we have fifty thousand dollars that we received as part of our capital julian and i are working very closely on that and that is to assess our overall wiring Wi-Fi technology structure just to see if we can identify some of the issues and concerns we've had, especially over the last couple of years related to um, connectivity in and around the building. So we are working on a report. We do have funding set aside next year in the capital plan to address any items that come out of this. And while we did just go through a lot of the Wi-Fi process, I want to say three to four years ago. As you can imagine, technology changes, needs change. So we wanted to, again, take a pause, assess where we are and come up with a plan that we can execute on over the next couple of years. The large scale technology projects, that is all infrastructure related. That is not tied to the day to day. Um, computers and smart boards that we're buying. So each year we map out high level infrastructure needs that we have and then work through that as part of our $100,000 allocation that we have each year. OK, sorry. Um, so this next slide here, we wanted to talk about some additional capital projects that are in progress. One of them is the uh, performance contracting phase two. Um, we have a, a small pilot project, we're calling it. This is all part of the um, the, the work we're going to be doing with Noresco um, townwide, which affects school and town buildings. This pilot project is going to be an LED upgrade um, of one of the schools where targeting in on a few locations right now. I'll know more in the next week or so. We're looking at the pricing right now. So that'll be the first phase pilot uh, pilot project, and then it'll lead into the larger performance contracting initiative once we know what the once we have the project built. <clears throat> so I'll jump in quickly and then turn it over to Joe for the Preliminary capital, again, this is very high level preliminary as 
most of you remember when we did the finance committee meetings back in October and November, there was a lot of discussion about capital and items that we could look to target to spend on. So this is preliminary what we have right now. The telephone replacement, that's what I just mentioned. Next year we are targeting Barrows and to the extent we have additional funding, there are some upgrades for Killam and Eaton that we can do and that'll round out our telephone replacement project. We have the $100,000 large scale infrastructure funding that we receive each year. And then as I mentioned, we do have a $200,000 allocation to address items that are coming out of the study we have this year. We are looking to complete that study within the next month so that we can circle back with Bob to talk about the results of it, um, work with him and John on what the right approach is going forward and solidify the placeholder that we have. And I will let um, Joe talk about the next two items. So the next two items are um, to get the ball rolling. We're going to want to do a design to re for a roof replacement at the Parker Middle School as well as a design for the high school stadium and track on turf one. So those two items are going to be done ahead of the actual project so that when we get funding for the actual capital, we have a uh, a design ready to go up to bid with. And that's what that's 250 on each one of those uh, items is for. Okay, thank you, Joe, Gail. Uh, does uh, Ed, Ed Ross had a question? Th thanks, Chuck, um, and, and thanks, um, uh, Joe and, and Gail, for that stuff. Uh, so a couple of questions I had. Hey, Joe, when you, when you go through the facilities um, and, you know, and all of the buildings, does that include the modulars too, or are they under a separate like kind of warranty or and it, were you uh, from, from that perspective? In terms of the maintenance on the buildings or? Yeah. So they're considered they're the overall budget for like a, a school, for instance, like Birch Meadow. Birch Meadow has a separate budget under the core facilities budget. So it's attached to that to that location as far as the expenses go to answer your question. Uh, we do age them just like, you know, there's there's equipment associated with each one of the modulars at all the schools um, at the four locations. So the equipment that's on the roofs of those buildings, the equipment, you know, the, the uh, building envelope, if you will, is all um, aged and tracked within our work order system and in our capital plan for, for our targeted replacements. Cool, thanks. Uh, and then, yeah, the only question that I have for you, you mentioned, um, you know, kind of in, in the technology uh, piece, uh, so it, which which section of it had the piece around uh, Wi-Fi? Just out of curiosity, at, um, was that in the longer term, you know, assessment that you were doing? That is the sixty thousand dollars that we're spending this year. We are looking at that, and then the placeholder for next year is the two hundred thousand to start to address any issues that come out of it. We have hired an external firm that Julian and I are working with that is helping us go through the assessment. We're working closely with them as well as we're bringing in um, from Joe's team, the town electrician who's very familiar with all of the various wiring and cabling of the building. So it's a very collaborative process for the assessment. What was your question about wireless or Wi-Fi? Or the malware. I thought that's what I, I, I might have misheard it. That's right. I thought it was. I thought I heard the piece about um, Wi-Fi. Sorry, Julian. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Gail was mentioning the fact that we had done a Wi-Fi project three years ago, and and uh, and the result of that project has impacted uh, or has identified some weaknesses in our network that we're trying okay. to identify. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Appreciate it. Thanks, uh, Chuck. Sean. Sean. Oh, I'm good. Thanks, Chuck. My question was answered. Okay. That's the third time. We're going to have to let Sean go first. I, uh, yeah. Says race, I'm not having my sharpest night, if I'm being honest. Please disregard, and then it says raise again. 
I know, I know. I'm answering my own questions while I while I wait my turn sometimes. I apologize. So, uh, Joe, uh, I had a question on the uh, design fees for the uh, for the roof and the and the. Uh, you, I think you said that is it the track or the or the actual turf? It's the actual is the track in the turf on the stadium. So does that when when you charge those design fees, is that something that you can ultimately uh, work into your negotiation with the with the vet final or the selected vendor in terms of so offsetting some of that? It's it's two separate things. Usually the design fee is usually 10% of the total project, roughly 10%, depending on what type of project it is. It's two separate things though, because the design is is done. It's never the same company that designs it and builds it. Okay. It. So what it is is you um, that type of work that we're doing out there is, believe it or not, considered public works construction. So because um, it's not it's not buildings. So we would work closely like we did the last time with public works, hire a designer to design the design the track um, and the turf and get a whole package ready to go and the drawings, everything and the bidding and the construction administration involved in managing the project with us. That's what that that money is. You're looking at. That's what most of that money is. Okay, thank you. Uh, Aaron. So I, I had a design fee question as well, but regarding the roof. Um, so forgive my ignorance, but um, why do we need a design to replace a roof? Oh, it's not like a typical roof on a, a shingle roof on a house. First of all, um, there are code requirements involved in putting roofs on um, commercial buildings and even residential buildings. Um, the energy code has changed quite a bit in the last few years and the requirements for insulation um, on the rooftops on the roofs have, has also changed. So you need to have someone come out, a structural engineer would have to come out and look at the the structure of the building, how it's built, um, see what the drainage is looking like, how the roofs drain, for instance. So there's quite a bit of work involved. It's not just a matter of tearing the roof off and putting a new rubber roof on there. There's spe special processes used, and we would also pick out what type of roof we want, um, which is the most energy efficient. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Darren. Uh, Carla? I guess uh, the design portion of it um, has the most questions because mine was was kind of piggybacking a little bit on on Chuck on Chuck's question of um, of the 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 design piece kind of being rolled into potentially the contractor piece. I was thinking of that more for the stadium. Um, it seems like such a specialty item. Is that typical for a stadium type of work? Just because it's so specialized that they would be kind of a design build type of um, contract? So the the design fee for the stadium uh, turf one um, is actually less than 10%. And the reason, part of the reason for that is because there's an existing field out there and an existing track, okay? So um, it is a highly specialized um, type of work that only a few architectural civil engineering architectural firms do. We had great success with the company that we used on turf too. Um, so that would be something we would, you know, we would vet out and, you know, bring in a few companies and see who can give us the best price um, and design the field for us and then put it out to bid. But it is separate. It's a okay. separate, it's a separate thing. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, Joe. You're welcome, thank you. So just I, just two, two more slides, uh, Gail, you wanna handle them? Yeah, I almost forgot there were more slides. <laughs> <clears throat> These are quick. So what we usually like to try to do at the end of each meeting is give a preview for what is coming. So next Thursday evening, we will be um, Chris Kelly and I will do the regular day. Dr. Stice and I will do special education. 
Um, mainly they will do the presentations. I will backfill to help address any specific budgetary questions they have, but that will be the focus of next week's meeting. On Thursday, January 21st, we do have the public hearing and discussion and that notice did go out and just wanted to remind folks that that actually will be a Zoom meeting rather than a Teams meeting, given the nature of what that meeting is. Also at that meeting, we typically after the public hearing will put time aside to address questions that the committee has on the budget and then we meet again on January 25th to take the vote. Once the vote is done, we do address and make any changes that the committee has put forth and then we do provide the budget to the town manager no later than January 31st and I believe that is per the charter. And Gail, uh, you you wanted committee questions by yes. next Friday by next Friday we are asking oh, if, there it is. Yes, if <laughs> committee members could provide us their questions by next Friday that will give us time to go through them as for the members that are new to the committee we do take the questions and provide written responses to them what we have started to do in the past which past couple of years which has worked well for the committee is once we receive all the questions we do group them by theme so that where we can address all of the questions so we do put them thematically rather than sort of by person that way once it's addressed once we can expand upon it and use it that way so ideally if folks could get it to us it is a very iterative process it involves pretty much all members of central office we work with um, myself, John, Dr. Stice, Chris Kelly, and to the extent it reaches out to other areas we, we do have, whether it's Julian, Tom, um, Joe, Mary, Anna, we, we do reach out to a lot of people. So that's why it is important that we receive the questions because it is a pretty labor intensive process. And that's all I have. Okay, great job. Uh, I didn't think there were any budget questions in the chat. At least I didn't I'll check again, but no. OK, uh, there there aren't. But if it's a good time to go before the next portion of the agenda, there is one from the beginning of the meeting. If you want to address that one now. Sure, there's one there's one that fits perfectly with the winter update, I think. And then there's one that's uh, a feedback on the beginning of the meeting. OK. Uh, Michelle Sanfi, Glenmere Circle. After watching the first 10 minutes of tonight's meeting, I was incredibly disappointed in how Mrs. Shanklin's statement was received. It spoke volumes that another administrator felt the need to address the committee this evening. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, John, did you want to do the uh, winter hybrid update? Sure. I'm going to pull up another. PowerPoint. So, um, I want to give you a quick update tonight. Uh, a little bit of, and I've got uh, Mary is here as well uh, to. Uh, uh, add things that I may have missed it also to certainly answer uh, all, any questions that you may have regarding uh, the health health pieces. So uh, this week, as you know, um, and you know, I, I guess I want to back up for a second. Uh, I know I did send out a rather lengthy email on Sunday. Uh, prior uh, and before that, I sent out an email uh, on Wednesday about us going remote and the, the rationale behind that. We we've been looking at the data now, obviously for several weeks and Mary Mary and her team uh, have done an amazing job contact tracing every time we have a school um, case and. That sometimes uh, is a significant uh, not sometimes all the time is a significant amount of work because you have to follow 
you know, really a trail of who may have been within six feet for a, a set period of time, um, depending on the classroom or the event or um, the, the room that the, the students or the staff may be in. So as those numbers were, were ticking up, um, we had been following this very closely for a couple of weeks and we had a conversation last week uh, during the break um, that we were very concerned about the numbers that we had in front of us um, and that we felt that it was in the best interest of our students um, to go remote and our staff to go remote this week. When we when we first started the week, um, we met with the uh, administrative team. We all had concerns about our highest high need students. There's about 25 of those students between preschool and elementary. These are students that absolutely cannot access any form of remote learning because of their disabilities. Um, these are some of our most vulnerable students. And so we made the decision uh, with a very small amount of staff over three buildings uh, to bring those 25 students in for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of this week. And um, that has been going very well. And I want to thank those staff um, who have come in, those teachers, those paraeducators, um, obviously the building principals and school nurses um, and other staff that are that have been there for for those kids. We also, as a result of us going remote um, because of our concerns of health, and I'm going to show you a little bit data later regarding athletics. Um, we did postpone athletic events um, on one on January 2nd. Next week is a different story. We've been monitoring the data this week. Um, Mary and I met again this morning. Uh, we felt uh, that we could move forward with having our uh, regular, if there is a regular schedule this time uh, this year, our regular schedule for in-person learning for next week. So it's a cohort B week. Our high needs preschool and kindergarten will be in person. I have had some questions from parents on why not split the week and bring cohort A in for two days and cohort B in for the other two days um, so that everyone has some in-person learning. And you know, as as we've already learned, um, th this schedule is going to change. It's going to fluctuate. And at the beginning of the year, we actually had more cohort A in-person days than cohort B in-person days. So um, it's too early to make that call to try to adjust the calendar. I would rather do it when um, things stabilize, the weather stabilizes. Um, and we could take a look at it to see exactly what um, the balance is between cohort A day in-person days and cohort B in-person days. Um, in addition, we are going to be um, bringing back athletics, extracurricular activities in person starting tomorrow. The only exception to that is going to be gymnastics, the site where gymnastics practice and um, meets uh, occur is is closed um, right now in North Reading uh, by the uh, for, for health reasons. So uh, they really do not have a location at this point. We are also going to continue to follow the DPH quarantining guidelines for all athletic positive cases. Um, when when we have and I'm going to go into this and Mary certainly will can add to it when we have to shut down a team, it's because we do have a positive case and they were in close contact uh, with their with their teammates um, before before they tested positive and um, before they knew they had tested positive. Uh, those are DPH guidelines. Those are not Reading Public School guidelines. And so we we have to follow that um, if we do have any positive cases. Mary, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to what I just said. No, I think just that, um, you know, when we were looking at it also, um, there were some di school districts that sort of um, 
um, decided to um, go remote after Christmas or, you know, kind of um, ahead of time. And we were trying to just look at the numbers and see what was going on in our community. And we decided at that time it was a really um, made the most sense um, because of those concerns. And I, I do feel a lot better after having this week to be able to um, trace the positive cases that have come up after the holiday and just um, all of the nurses really feel more um, confident that people um, had the opportunity to test if they if they were um, had the need to do so and um, evaluate for symptoms um, after any holiday gatherings and we're in a better a better position to come back for for next week. So I do think that um, it was a smart move. So I want to. This chart is actually now, I believe, on the Town of Reading website. Um, if not, it will be soon. It is shown, um, and it may be too small of a print, but it shows on the the left hand side. The far left is uh, the beginning of this pandemic on March 18th, and up to December 30th on the uh, right hand side of the chart. And it it shows. Um, you can see the the green stands for. Uh, confirmed cases. So obviously that's going to keep going up over time. Um, the first blue line are the current active cases in the community in town. And the the dark blue line or the third line is the increase per week. So you could see that our active cases right now are at its highest point that they've been since the beginning of the pandemic, which is is not unusual for uh, our community or other communities in the area. Um, you can see there's been a slight dip in the increase per week um, leading up to the end of the year. So I know that the town is now going to start showing this, this uh, graphic instead of just the, um, the numbers. So um, Mary was kind enough to send me the cases as of uh, January 6th. Um, this is for this school year. Um, so you could see here that it's broken down by the total cases, uh, the number that were positive when they were remote, the number that were positive when they were in person, the number of current active cases, and the number that have been quarantined. The quarantine numbers do not include athletics, and I'm going to um, show you that one uh, in a minute. And then the number of in-school transmissions. So you can see that the obviously the high school is the biggest school, so they would they would have um, the most the most cases um, at this at this juncture uh, total cases. Um, we also have had 29 staff um, test positive. Uh, we is seven current active staff cases, and over time we've had 55 quarantine. Our largest quarantine group, uh, understandably so, has been our elementary. That really is because um, we, we feel that when there is a positive case in an elementary classroom, uh, elementary students obviously are not as good as keeping the six foot distancing as the other levels. So we have been really making it a practice that when a sat, when a, either a satellite room or the the opposite room um, has a positive case that we do quarantine that entire room out of an abundance of caution. We have had three in school transmissions and there are two additional possible cases uh, that have not been identified as in school transmission. Uh, one case was a high school student to staff. Another one was a staff to staff and another one was staff to a preschool student. The athletic cases, um, so we've broken it down uh, by winter preseason, winter first week, last week in which there were no sports, the total for the winter, and then the total for the fall. Um, obviously in the fall, because we had less cases in general and fall is, it's not more of an outdoor um, sporting season. Uh, we had less cases and less quarantine, um, but we first started getting cases uh, winter preseason when we did have some some cases uh, related to hockey with some of the um, either captain's practices or um, hockey events that were taking place off um, 
offsite with non Reading um, uh, uh, Memorial High School uh, teams, but had Reading Memorial High School students on it. Um, the winter first week we did end up with seven with nine cases and 72 were quarantined. Last week was a no sports week. Um, we, we have currently three active cases. I point this out. Um, actually, we have four. Uh, a fourth one I think was identified today. I, I point this out because. If those in, students were at practice last week when we were. Um, when and they when they were positive, um, we would have had to shut down those teams and quarantine them. So that was our big concern, and we were aware of these active cases as we were going through our decision making process. All of the sports at this point have been impacted um, in winter. So this is what I was mentioning earlier. This is right from the guidance from MassDPH. Um, they have a Q&A and this is the question who should be quarantined for hockey and any situation where you have tournaments, games, scrimmages, practices, all personnel participating on the ice should be quarantined and tested if exposed to a single confirmed case. If two teams played against each other and it was a single player with COVID-19 on the ice, both teams are recommended to be quarantined and get tested. Um, what was happening uh, in hockey has been hit the hardest with the lack of tryouts and practices um, because of the stops and starts, but hockey is allowed, according to MIA, to have 25 players on the ice at one time for a practice. So that was part of the problem with when we did have a positive or two cases, um, it really in, impacted an entire group of, of students on the team. Um, and we had to shut down the whole team for that reason. Mary, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add with any of these slides I just mentioned. That, that's correct. That's from the GPH. OK. So I just want to bring back, bring back the Middlesex League piece. Um, and this is a slide that I showed the last time. Um, I will tell you other communities are having similar uh, situations where teams have had to get shut down. Um, there was a, a game this past weekend where both teams had to get shut down because it was a positive case. I believe it was a sub varsity game in another community. Um, so th this is this is not just a Reading issue. This is happening in other other Middlesex League communities and I'm sure in other um, other league communities as well. Um, in terms of uh, the, the practice, we're hoping that there will be some games starting up again Saturday. I know Mr. Zaya has been working on trying to secure ice for practices for tomorrow, but also games for Saturday or perhaps Sunday. I believe basketball is a go for um, for Saturday for here at the Fieldhouse. Um, and I'm sure that Mr. Zaya, is, is, if he hasn't already, will be sending out communication on that. I know the piece that people have brought up have been the spectators. The Middlesex League has had some informal communication, but we've not met again. At this point, we are going to be scheduling another meeting. Um, a lot of the superintendents were away during the break. Um, the feeling still is uh, not to have spectators from a health standpoint. Um, I know the governor has also um, extended the, the restrictions on capacity a few more weeks um, uh, for, for large, large areas. So we will be meeting again as a Middlesex League group of superintendents and athletic directors to discuss this. Um, we are working on a live stream version right now. Uh, RCTV has put into place the infrastructure, um, but the uh, cameras need to be uh, are being ordered and they have not arrived yet. So the, the games this weekend will be taped and then posted on the RCTV uh, YouTube website. And that, that will be all communicated uh, by Mr. Zayn. So I guess I'll stop there at this point.
and answer any questions on this uh, section. Are there any uh, questions from the committee? Uh, Tom. Uh, thanks, Chuck. Uh, John, thank you for the update uh, and the details. It's it's great to see that it helps people and removes removes confusion in the communication and and, and whatnot. Uh, also, want to thank you and Mr. Zaya for working on the video uh, for the games. Uh, there was even just a question on that today, so hearing that progress is being made there is is much appreciated. Um, if you can go back a slide or two to the um, the number of cases per season slide, yeah, this one. Yeah. Um, the three for fall um, surprises me. I thought we had heard and I thought we published that there were more in fall, um, in particular uh, one particular team, and then maybe, and ma but maybe you're also thinking, or maybe I'm thinking or confusing quote captains practices that aren't official fall sports that were correct. impacted. So yeah, that's that's correct. There's another sport which didn't play this fall um, that hopefully will play in another season. Um, that was having practices, um, and that's where some of the cases were. Okay, so there was only three on one of the official teams, and right. then maybe those three coaches, and maybe that's why I, six was the number was in my head. Um, so maybe it's the three plus three here, or, or it's the three plus the captain's practice teams in the case, yeah. may, case maybe. Yes, okay. that was in-season in athletes, Tom, for that. Thank you. Thank you both for the clarification. OK, John. OK. I want to give a few other updates. Uh, one is on time and learning. Um, I know. Oh, I think Aaron has a question, Chuck. Hi, Aaron. Sorry. It's OK. Um, we had a question in the chat, um, which was also actually something that I was wondering myself. Um, it's from Mr. Cerrone. I can read it or yeah, something else. Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah. Um, would co so Mark Cerrone, 49 Victoria Ave, would cohorts set up for varsity JV and freshman teams with no swing players moving from team to team indicate that this was set up so that a COVID case could be isolated to that team and the others would be able to continue? So, so yes, except, you know, with the exception of hockey, if, if students are, are um, cohorted, so that the close contacts are minimized when we do contact tracing and they can say that only this group of eight players or 10 players um, were within close contact. Yes, only that group would be quarantined. Um, but as you know, um, Dr. Darty mentioned, um, ice hockey is um, an exception to that. OK, but for example, if, if a freshman boys basketball player tested positive the JB and varsity boys and all the girls teams would not be um, sidelined. Correct, and Equally. that's what that's what we yeah. have done when that's when that's occurred. Um, if we, if we can't, unless they are you know scrimmaging against each other or practicing together, if there if there's only that small group, that's the only ones that need to be quarantined, and the rest can continue to play. Okay. We we did we did have a situation early in the tryouts, uh, Aaron, with basketball where the freshman team wasn't even at uh, at the site that day so they were allowed to continue to practice um where the jv and varsity could not because okay. they were on the same area okay um one more question um on the slide where uh you showed number of of athletes in the seasons um do we know I don't, I don't know quite how to word this. Do we know that those cases were passed within, like from teammate to teammate, or that numbers could simply reflect that an athlete in a winter sport tested positive for COVID? So for the most part, we're finding that it's not because we're quarantining um, the, the students. And um, so we're reducing the spread within, within the sport. Um, I think um, in, in gymnastics, we did see a number of, of athletes all um, test positive. And I believe at the 
time. I'm not the the regulations around mask wearing in gymnastics um, are kind of confusing to me. I'm not sure. So that may have have led to that. But in general, we are seeing um, a positive case um, during a practice and we are quarantining the team and we're not seeing further spread. And that's that's the purpose of, of doing the contact tracing and quarantining so that we're not we're not having a whole team come down, um, you know, with the infection. Does that Absolutely. answer your question? Yeah, it does. I I guess I was also just trying to get at um, where we think the spread is happening and whether it's actually happening within the teams or outside of practice, but then some players are bringing it to practice, if that makes sense. Right. The majority of spread at this point is household spread. So that's what we're seeing. That's what the numbers across the state, if you look at the data um, and that. It, and so, um, you know, the athletes didn't know they were exposed or uh, maybe had a family member who became positive and then they became positive and they were at practice at a time when they themselves could spread it. And so that's why we do the quarantine. So we've seen a couple of, of um, students, um, athletes on the same team, but um, sometimes they also carpool and things like that. So they may have had outside contact as well. So um, I can't say that there's not spread throughout the teams, but it's 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 limited. And I think the protocols that we're using and the quarantining that we're doing is helping that. That's great. Thank you, Mary. Tom. Uh, thank you as well, Mary. I think that the details there are again very helpful um, and the limiting the spread is very helpful. I, I just want to drill a little bit more into Mark Cerrone's question and make sure I understood the answer. Um, and I, I think I understood the question he was asking too, but maybe I'm a little bit naive about the hockey, how the hockey team practices. So if in theory, um, the ninth graders practice distinctly by themselves on the ice, they leave. The JV team comes in, practices distinctly by themselves on the ice, they leave, and the varsity team does the same. Could we contain it to just the team if they if the players don't cross over? Um, I, I think you were focusing on the ice portion of it, and maybe it's because they all practice at the same time, and that's my naivete in the question. Um, but I'm just trying to see uh, what Mr. Cerrone is trying to ask. If, they're, if they really are separate and distinct, and they're separate and distinct on the ice, then couldn't they be quarantined separate and distinctly, just like basketball or other sports? Yes, when we do contract tracing, and I don't know much about hockey, but I asked the coach who was, were there 10 guys on the ice or were there 20 guys on the ice? And whoever was on the ice at that time on that day, when a person was potentially infectious, that's who's quarantined. So, so okay. yes, if they, as long okay. as they had it mixed, just like the other, the other um, sports, if their levels and are only practicing um, whoever's practicing at that time, yes. Okay, so I guess the, the follow-up question of that, Dr. Doherty would be, and you may know, um, you know what, what the practice schedule is and what the cost is. Is this something we could support if we even have enough ice time to have the three teams practice separately or are they currently practicing together and that's why the quarantining is hitting the whole team at once? No, I don't believe it has anything to do with uh, the ice time piece. Uh, the hockey team still hasn't finished tryouts yet. Um, in what I Okay, so they haven't even separated so their cohorts yet. Correct. Okay. So they were they were having 25 students on the ice at a time. OK, so thank I believe you. That helps that's, me understand. I yeah, I that. think that. Yeah, I they yeah, yeah. they haven't finished. Their and, it, and it's only two teams. It's JV and varsity. There is no freshman hockey team. Correct. Right? Correct. Right. Uh, Carla. And, and to add to that. Um, it's my understanding that they're even willing to um, further divide those teams during um, tryouts to to kind of have them into separate co cohorts as well, um, through my understanding of it as well. Um, Mary, thank you for that clarification that um, the spread of this virus is not predominantly happening on the ice, on the courts, um, and at practices, because I think there's a lot of, um, there may be some um, difference of opinion as to how it is spread. Um, and just because we, for this purpose, are categorizing um, these positive cases as athletes, right? And specifically categorizing them as a certain athlete of a certain sport, um, doesn't mean that that's happening um, during practice, right, or during um, during games. Well, 
uh, scrimmages at least. So, so thank you for clarifying that that spread is happening in other places. I, I'm glad to see that sports are opening up again, um, simply because if, and I'm, I'm happy to see that school is opening up again or in school, um, we're gonna be in school um, because I think it's more important to have these kids in more confined environments where they are, where there are protocols set up. Um, when they're not in school for the day and when they're not um, able to practice, then they are, we're kind of pushing people underground, so to speak, right? Um, to, to, to see each other outside of school and outside of sports. So I'd rather see people, I'd rather see these students um, be able to, to, to be together and, um, and do what they need to do with that type of protocol um, that they get at sports um, and, and in school. So I think that um, a big part, I, I wish last week never happened with all the angst that um, many went through. And um, I, I think that if they, and I know Dr. Doherty, it seems like you're gonna get to this portion of it. If, if this, these high school kids were in school for those four days every other week, like the rest of the district is, um, this wouldn't have been as heightened. So um, we, we need to get these kids back in school four days every other week. Um, and we need them to, to, we need to allow them to be able to do um, what they need to do as kids um, with these precautions because our precautions work, right? Our precautions work and the protocols you have set up for the schools and sports work. So um, thank you, Mary, for all you do. Um, I can't even imagine what you and your whole group are going through, but um, we really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you, Carl. Okay, John, uh, we can go into the learning part of it. So I just I just wanted to expand a little bit on uh, the last presentation I did on time and learning. We've received a little bit more information and I, I don't know uh, if people saw in the email I did send Sunday. I know it was rather lengthy that I did have a link to the DESE website that has the time and learning requirements um, for all the communities. Um, so just to briefly go over it again, um, effective on January 19th, uh, schools have to have a, if they're in hybrid, have to have a minimum of 35 hours of live instruction, which is defined as uh, both in-person and remote synchronous instruction. So a combination of the of the two over a 10 day period. Um, so for Reading, um, what that means is, and when this survey was done, we did not have uh, fourth grade in yet. Um, so that's why it said remote. This is when, this was November 2nd when fourth grade had not started theirs yet. Um, but you could see that at the elementary, it's 41 at the, middle and high school, it's 48. So we're well above the 35 hours. When you look at the chart itself, um, 99 districts are at 45 hours or above, uh, 172 districts are below 45 hours. So, uh, you know, again, this is a this is a credit to all the work that's been done to um, beef up our remote piece, provide really strong synchronous remote learning and a strong uh, in-person piece as well. So I just wanted to to add a little bit more to what I discussed last time because now we have the additional DESE data. Um, one of the other things that we wanted to share with you is that it's it's been a period of time, even if we came back this week, it would have been a period of time that the students were out. Um, we were seeing some fatigue, shall we say, leading up to vacation with our health and safety precautions. Um, I think that's what led to some of our in-school transmission pieces. Um, so we will be doing a, a, a more of a point of emphasis um, of some things that we've been emphasizing all along, uh, but really um, to emphasize these even more. So our administrators, our teachers, um, all staff and students. So
So the face covering piece is critical. Um, the six foot physical distancing, uh, making sure the cohorts stay, especially in the elementary and middle school, stay as their own separate cohorts, including recess time. Um, it doesn't make any sense to combine cohorts at recess and keep them separated the rest of the time. Um, good, they need to be separated all the time. The hand hygiene, uh, making sure that all these procedures are followed at lunch except when eating and fine tuning the adult contact tracing in classrooms. We're working on a system where um, every adult going in and out of rooms where um, for a period of time, because we're, we're realizing that a lot of adults are going in and out of rooms, particularly at the elementary level, um, servicing students and related service providers, paraeducators. So we're going to improve our um, sign in, sign out procedures in every classroom uh, so that we have a better handle of the adults that were in a room if we have to do any contact tracing to help support our uh, uh, nurses. So the last piece I want to talk about related to learning is the um, survey. I don't have all of the results tonight. Uh, I didn't want because I knew we were going to be under time constraints. So I'm going to show you a couple of, uh, of the slides. Um, I will do more extensive uh, survey results um, at our uh, next meeting or if we have a separate non budget meeting, I'll be more than happy to do a full fledged presentation. I did show some of these slides the last time, but uh, we were still in the middle of the survey. So we did have 337 staff complete the survey, 1,599 parents, 958 students. That's grades 6 through 12. Um, for the students, um, similar to what I showed you the last meeting, uh, most of the responses are three, four, and five, uh, the combination. So it does show that the experience as a whole, uh, regardless of the model that the students are in, um, again, this is uh, grade six through 12, uh, is um, on the positive side. For parents, um, similar, similar feeling. Um, actually, the fives are a little bit higher when compared to the students. So again, a very strong um, experience for uh, it from a parent's perspective and staff again seeing a similar uh, pattern of uh, three fours and fives. What I did want to show on the next couple of slides is the, the high school piece. Um, so I'm doing it from three perspectives. I asked the question, for high school parents, high school teachers, high school students. This one is the parent question. Um, which model would they prefer for their students? You can see that 60% um, would want to go to a four day in person, four day live stream, two day remote model. Um, 20, approximately 20% would rather keep the current model and um, and I didn't leave that number and I apologize. No preference to either model, probably about 10% it looks like. Um, um, and then 13% is their child is fully remote. When you shift to the teachers, you see almost the exact opposite results. 67% um, would like to keep the current model, 10.2%. Uh, would be the four days in person, four days live stream, and 22.7% did not have a preference. And then when you ask the students, we get even more confused because it's a third, a third, a third, approximately. Um, approximately 40% four days in person, a little under 40%, 27.2%, um, no preference, 33.9% current model. So I can stop there for a second. Take any questions? I will I'll actually let me expand on that a little bit more. So um, 
we are having some conversations. Um, I believe it's later this week or to, it's tomorrow because there's only one more day this week um, to discuss further. What can we do differently at the high school? Um, we've not been able to hire any additional paraeducators. Just at this point, even though we've continued to um, post the positions, uh, so we are uh, we are having some additional conversations um, with with staff and administration on is there something we can do differently to get the high school students in uh, more days. Are there any uh, questions from the committee? Can we read the comment? I was going to say there, there are, we have three Q and A yeah. comments. If there are no committee questions, is, yeah. Is there any other slides, John? Uh, yeah, I do have a few, but th th this is the last one on this section. Okay, uh, so Tom, do you want to read the one from uh, uh, Katie Johnson? Sure, Katie Johnson, twenty-three yeah. Carver Road. Please answer when appropriate. This question is regarding when RMHS will be moving to full hybrid. This fall, I, along with hundreds of other concerned RMHS parents, volunteered to serve as paraeducators so that our children could return to school on a more meaningful basis. That plan was rejected. Next, a call went out from John Doherty and Kate Boynton to try and formally hire paraeducators needed to implement the full hybrid. I actually applied for that job as well, but today was told that they have not been able to hire the appropriate number of paras and they will not be moving forward with this model either. My question is this, if plan A and plan B will not work, what is your plan C? Thank you. I, and I don't have an answer at this point. I, it's what I just said earlier. Yep. And uh, I, I can read, you don't have to read them all. So we have one from Pam Higgins of 315 Summer Avenue. Uh, what is the plan time frame to get the high school students in the building more than four times a month. What will trigger the switch to at least full hybrid? High school students need to be in the building. And we. Wait, one more. Do one more. Um, Kathy Donnelly, 246 Charles Street. Uh, regular hybrid back next week. That's a four days or is that the two day modified hybrid? When are, when are we planned to have four instead of two out of 10 days? Thanks. So next week is two days, right, John? Yeah, we're, we're, right, we're right back to the model that we had prior to um, the Christmas break. Yeah. So I guess, Chuck, I do have a, a question or I guess sure. more of a comment. Um, First, I mean, first, I would say this. I think the 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 work done by the staff and the administration with regards to the remote instruction model, the live synchronous model that uh, we have, um, from my perspective, has gone exceedingly well, um, both from personal and from many other parents I've talked with. Um, the focus on physical health, I think, uh, um, is is appreciated as as well. Um, what I fear and what my concern is, is the the emotional health. Um, you know, I, I think we, we received a couple emails on it and we started doing, I mean, we've been doing really research. I started doing even more research and there are pretty staggering statistics coming in on the emotional health side um, that I think we really need to make sure that we're understanding in addition to the physical health. Um, and we, uh, there was, a, I know, I understand there was a PTO meeting I wasn't able to attend as well, where there was discussion on emotional health, which was, I think, relatively well received. Um, but we, that also, we need to make sure, or we need to try as hard as possible. I know you're working with the team, John. I know Kate and the rest of the uh, administration team are working too. But that emotional health side is part of them being there in person. Um, you know, we, I gave anecdotal things in the past about the communication, the conversations, the, the things the kids can't really do when they're in breakout rooms so much, they can't really do when they're not in person. Um, that is just so much, 
so important from a high school perspective. Um, from you know that social gathering perspective, if we want to call it social emotional health, yeah, it's that too. But it's really more the mental health I'm focusing on. Um, make sure these kids can yeah, recover. Frankly, I mean, nine months of almost isolation. Uh, I had, you know I think when we counted back, and in some cases we're talking six or seven days that some of our high school students have been in school since March 13th. Um, that's not that many. If you're not playing a sport. Uh, and seeing other kids a lot. If you're not uh, in drama or art or or, or um, chorus and seeing a lot of kids a lot, you're pretty lonely. And loneliness is a dangerous place to be. So I would really, really hope that we can move something forward in this space. Um, and I appreciate all the effort that's happened so far. So thank you. Thank you, Aaron. So I, I agree with everything that Tom was just saying. Um, I did attend the PTO meeting the other night. It was a really nice presentation um, from one of the social workers and one of the guidance counselors. Um, but some things that really stood out for me were um, the volume of parents expressing that, you know, maybe their kids look okay in class. Maybe they their transcripts look okay, but they're not doing okay um, and how do we how do we help those kids how do we support them and I think that um, you know even our our guidance counselors are, are then put in a position of, of chasing down kids um, when usually they're they're the place where kids can go they're the safe place where kids can go during school um, and uh, I know we have talked about this <laughs> so many times um and I, again this is this is not a, a knock on our remote learning i i believe our remote learning is a very very strong platform um, i believe teaching and learning are happening um, but i still feel that we have to get our high school students in more um, and i i guess i'm i'm a little bit confused about how this was presented tonight. Um, I'm glad there's a conversation happening tomorrow. Um, I'm, it's a little bit vague when you say we are having a conversation tomorrow, um, exactly who you mean. Um, but I, I feel like we have, a, we have a solid option here, which is to send our kids in in cohorts, four days in person, the other half live streaming. Um, so, what will it take yeah, to, for us to, to move to, to that? that model? Aaron, it isn't just as simple as is doing that. Um, that model is different than what's happening right now at the other levels. So that's why we've got to work out the uh, logistics of making that happen. But is that the plan? Like, or is that are I, the I, logistics I'll, I'll to like when to say, is that going to start working, or working it's with still up ice, in the air? I'm just. I'm just telling you what I'm saying where we're working with high school administration and staff to see if we can change what we're doing right now. I, I don't know what else to tell you. I mean, that's the we all recognize that we want to get the high school kids in more. No one is disagreeing with that. We okay. do not have the paras to do the satellite classrooms. We've had one person apply for the number of vacant positions. That was the person that put a comment in the chat, the chat. So we have to look at an alternative. The only way you can do the alternative to get them in four days is to do an alphabet split one week and then the lower alphabet the next week. So but to do that, it means staff have to be in both weeks. In the other models that currently exist in our school district, that is not the case. Staff, for the most part, are in every other week in person. So those are the logistical challenges that we've got to figure out. Understood. I, I guess I'm looking for a little bit more of a, we're, we're gonna sit down and we're gonna figure out a way to get them in versus we're going to see if it's possible with leaving it still open that you're not going to change what's happening. I, 
Aaron, I, I've given you as much information as I can I can give you right now. I don't have any more specifics. OK, so will this be on our agenda next week with an update from what happens tomorrow? I give you an update at every meeting. And when does this quarter end? When does the first semester end? February 1st is the uh, start of second semester. OK. It'd be great to see something in place by second semester. Thank you, uh, Carla. Thanks, Chuck. Um, I, I, I too have a very high level of frustration with this. Um, it is it is <clears throat> my um, number one. Um, I I will take Tom's one step further <clears throat> in terms of the um, social emotional health. This week, um, it was determined to bring back our um, our our most fragile students, right? Um, teachers were there. They saw that um, these kids were really struggling and a decision was made within a couple of days to bring these students back. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was um, po potentially easier to see that these ch children were struggling. I feel like um, from what I've been hearing from parents and over the past week, I've probably caught in 50 plus individual emails from people um, and multiple phone calls and the frustration level of parents is not that their students are, um, you know, th they're concerned about their students. They're concerned about their social emotional health, period. Um, when you get into mental health stigmas, we have hit a mental health stigma. If we are able to see the physical um, clues of special, our special ed population not being able to, to, to do remote learning from home, and we have parents who are telling us that their children are emotionally suffering and we're not jumping on it, then we have a huge issue. Um, I personally know of four suicides, attempted suicides, one was successful, of college age students. Three are local. Um, so when people say that we're not seeing the emotional, social emotional health, they have their heads in the sand. These kids need to get in. I've said it before. You have a child who is well adjusted and you put COVID on top of it, that child is going to suffer. You have a child who is not well adjusted and you put COVID on top of it, you've tipped that child over the edge. We have made a commitment to the district that we are going to get our children into school full hybrid. We have done that for a portion of our students. It's not a question of do you want to come in or not kids and teachers do you want to come in and parents do you want your kids in? We made that commitment and we need to fulfill that commitment. And, and I know in my head I can tell you a solution and I think I pretty much understand the problems. We need to make it happen and, and and we need to make it happen like three weeks ago, not we're going to see what happens. I agree with Aaron. I want a timeline. I want to see what's going to happen. The 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 um, the unrest that we had last week was not because of sports. The unrest we had last week were parents who were concerned about their students and and it, um, it, it we need to get those kids back in. Um, and, and I would be happy to be on a committee if you would if you would if you would um, welcome my my suggestions. Thank you. John. I, I, Carla, to your point, you're talking 25 students versus 800. Um, logistically, quite a difference. I, I agree completely. We need to get these kids for the high school back in. Can you, sorry, John, define 25 versus 800, please? We brought we brought 25 kids in this past week for, for high needs. We're looking at bringing in 800. I'm, I'm comparing and, social emotional, John. I'm comparing. But, but no, you gave the numbers. So right. let's put the numbers on the board. We can see, we can see that we can see the, if we can see the struggle of our um, special ed children, then we should You're be able to see 2500 of uh, excuse me 25 of our highest need special absolutely needs. right there's a huge difference there 
But uh, John, if we can, 800. So if we can get them in, shouldn't we get them in? I'm not saying we shouldn't, Carla. What I'm saying is you're not comparing apples to apples. These kids, these 25 have already been in. And it's mandated by the state that they have to be in as much as possible. And I, I, sorry, John, I'll let you. That's okay. You know what? You talk, I'll sit. All right. Uh, Tom. Yeah, just, I, th I think my interpretation of what Carla was trying to uh, say is that we are seeing, we're talking about um, somewhat of an, an invisible enemy here, right? That in some ways is becoming visible. Um, there's an invisible enemy from the virus perspective. There's an invisible enemy from an emotional health perspective. And that's the comparison I, I believe she was trying to draw. John, I understand your point about 25 versus 800. There is a logistical difference. I agree with you. There is a logistical difference. But we are facing something that part of the problem is we can't see it, right? Um, and we can't see it over Zoom. Uh, parents can see it. They can see their kids, you know, devolving. They can see their kids not getting up in the morning. They can see their kids' moods, you know, really shifting, going from a, a happy teenager to a really, really cranky. Some of that's just teenagerness, right? But a lot of it is is the fact that they're not able to get out of their house in many ways and and see their friends and interact and and stuff the teenagers are supposed to do. So we have an invisible enemy in front of us, right? We've all been battling it, every one of us, right? Um, some more than others, right? The front lines to a degree have been battling it much more than others. But the front front lines are some of the people who reached out to me over the last couple of weeks, right? The nurses that are in the trauma rooms that are talking about the suicide victims that are coming in. Um, their parents in the district too, and they're talking about what they're seeing in those spaces. I don't want that to be what, what shows up on the news for Reading Public Schools. Uh, and that's not, it's not a threat, it's nothing like that. It's just that we wanna make sure that we're doing right. And I know we've tried everything we possibly can to do right. We just have to figure out how we can get more kids in school more. Four days out of 10, it's better than, significantly better than two. It's still not where I think some of us wanna be, but at least it, it gets us on par with the rest of the district. Um, so just trying to even the waters there a little bit. Okay, anybody else? John raised his hand again, Chuck. John, sorry. That's all right. So um, did a little legwork and, and um, so right now in Middlesex, we've had zero increase in suicides in 2020. And I, I keep hearing this thrown out there that, you know, this is happening. Luckily, it's not happening in our region. We've got a very dynamic group of guidance counselors that are working their butts off to try to to quell that as much as possible. Our district leadership is working to try to figure out a way to bring these students back. Let's, and I get, I love my daughter to be in four days a week. I would absolutely love to have her senior year be every other week she's in school seeing people. This is not the same as, as we're used to right now. This is six feet apart, desk facing forward, no group projects or anything else that these high school students are used to. So it is no, we're not sending these kids back to the same high school that they left in March. And that's unfortunate. We're waiting for a vaccine. And I'd rather see that vaccine distributed and our kids go back safely. I'll be first and foremost. And I am incredibly excited that our nursing staff is has volunteered to be trained because maybe that can be delivered faster to our students. But we need to give, yes, Dr. Doherty has had a lot of time to try to figure this out. It's not working the way he's done it, and he's meeting to do and look for new changes. If there are ways we can support that, that's what we should be here to do. Thank you. Thank you. Sean? 
Um, so I'm a little bit hesitant to wade into this as the only one on the committee who hasn't, you know, doesn't have or hasn't had a high school student, but um, I want to make a couple of observations. One, I, I completely understand everybody's frustrations, right? Um, and, you know, I shouldn't say I completely understand, but I can empathize with everybody's frustrations about this. And I think there's, um, you know, a lot to be said for some of the points that the fellow committee members have made tonight. The, the one observation I want to make, though, is um, I think it's unfair for us to even for a moment imply that the, the leaders of our in our high school in particular are not um, don't have mental wellness, mental health at the top of their minds. Right. Um, three weeks ago we met and there was a lot of criticism directed at them because we were eliminating A pluses to in an attempt to preserve mental health over uh, over encouraging you know academic competition. Um, it came through loud and clear for me in that discussion that mental health, the mental wellness of our students is a top of all of our students is a top concern of our leadership team, of the team in the high school, the guidance team for sure. Um, and so I, I want to make sure that that's that's recognized. Um, we are we are dealing with very real constraints, some of which are immutable for us, some of which maybe aren't, but some of which are immutable for us. Um, and uh, there, there are things that people are asking us to do when they look at this and say, this is an easy problem to solve, you just do this, that we don't have the flexibility to do some of those things. We have to be realistic and, and, and honest about that. And so, um, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, Dr. Doherty, that you guys are going back to the well on this. Um, I think Aaron's observation that the semester break is coming up is a, is a you know, an important point because it's probably a better opportunity um, to do something you know a little bit more different, a little bit more disruptive than doing so in the middle of a, a semester might be. Um, but we you know we have to be pragmatic about the constraints that we're facing and that um, some of the things that we would all like to see happen may not be feasible. Um, and that's that's not to say that we shouldn't be trying and that we shouldn't expect a better solution or a better answer, um, or at least the proposal of a better solution or better answer. But you know. I, I just think we have to be realistic, and I, and I don't think it's fair to imply that any of the decisions that are being made are out of an you know ignorance of the mental of the the situation the concerns around mental health and the mental wellness of our students. I just I I don't see that um, with this team that's working on this problem. I don't think that's you know our limiting factor here. So um, you know again I you know I don't have the direct experience that all of you do you all of you have. So I'll caveat all, everything I just said with that, but. It's just an observation I wanted to make based on the last couple of discussions. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Carla. Carla. You're muted, Carla. Sean, I'll piggyback onto your your point a little bit in terms of um, of you know assessing kids, students, mental health. Right? Guidance does a great job with that. Those kids aren't in front of guidance, right? They're not, their teachers are good at assessing that. And the kids aren't spending enough time in front of their teachers to do that, right? If, if I, I can imagine, I don't have a high schooler at the moment, but I can imagine um, what these screens, what these Zoom um, screens look like, right? Maybe you see a piece of a kid, maybe you see a ceiling, maybe you see the screen is off. So who's doing that assessing? It's the parents, right? So we got to listen to the parents for one. Um, the, the original plan set forth by the district, right, which we all agreed on and we all, you know, thought it was a great idea. Um, our safety protocols certainly have been fabulous. Um, the satellite classroom scenario works in the elementary schools. The satellite classroom theory didn't work in the, at the middle school level, right? It didn't That's work. not true, Carla. Uh, let me, uh, let me, who's saying that? It's John. We, we do have oh, the satellite working in the middle schools. It, it didn't. It, it had to be massaged. Correct me if I'm wrong, John. No, it, had it to, didn't have to be massaged. We have it working in the middle schools. We have it working in the middle schools, but it didn't work as the middle schools were typically set up, right? The no, teams that's, were, not, that's not true. The teams were, what are they? They were um, four, four classroom teams, and now they're six. No, right. that, no, Parker decided to do it a little bit differently than Coolidge, but it is working. Absolutely, but it didn't work with the existing structure of the middle school, so it needed to be modified, right? The schedule was modified because eighth graders now are not, eighth graders are taking financial literacy and they're taking, um, 
separate classrooms and their and their um, their their home rooms are are six, right? I, per I, team. Respe I respectfully disagree with you. The middle school principals and I work together. Yeah. And because Parker is bigger than Coolidge, they did it a little bit differently, but the concept is still there. Absolutely. And, and maybe no, we're just- No, it is. It's not, it, I, I, I'm telling you it is. I mean, we've, we've been but, working on this. <laughs> I, I have an eighth grader at the I, I have an eighth grader at the high school and and I, I I I know that in her team there aren't just four um four classrooms per team there are six so she has less kids per classroom that is and, that is a choice that the middle school principal made exactly based on her school that absolutely was, and it and, was it was not. It did not require anything different. It followed it followed the model that we were talking about with satellite. And, and right, and it actually it 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 helped because she was able to um, to incorporate that satellite mentality. Right, they don't have satellite. My daughter's not in a satellite classroom. She they only do have satellites. They don't have as many as Coolidge because right. Coolidge is smaller. Right, because it needed to be modified in order to fit the satellite mentality. Right. My daughter's only in a class with 12 kids. Right. She doesn't need all, a of, our, all of our schools at elementary and middle area have approximately 12 kids in the satellite rooms. No, she does not have a satellite room. No, she my has, Carla, my point yeah. is, is that the way we've set it up. I, I'm getting a little frustrated here myself, and here's why. Because I think we're. We're under this impression that the administration doesn't care and isn't doing their job. We've been on the forefront with social emotional learning in this in this region for four or five years. We have been putting in all kinds of programs to support students. I am just as frustrated as parents that we can't get our high school kids in. But to sit there and to continue to tell us that we're not doing enough doesn't help the situation. As I've mentioned three times already tonight, we are working with administration and we are working with staff to try to get the kids in more. So we can continue to debate this all night or we can try to have a productive meeting with staff and administration tomorrow to try to get this done. Okay, uh, Sean. Um, my point's a little bit moot uh, <laughs> right now, so I'll let it go. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> that's that's the fourth time tonight. Yeah. Okay, uh, John, did you want to just Chuck, we have a couple the... of comments too, real quick from the Q&A. Uh, two I can speak to and one is pending an address, so I can't speak to that, that one. Um, Jeffrey Corum, Ridge Road. Would it make sense to consider trying parent volunteers again starting in Q3? Part of the concern with the first attempt was the risk of transmission due to Thanksgiving. And the other one is Pam Higgins, 315 Summer Avenue. Parents are frustrated because this is not a safety issue. It's a staffing issue. Our children should not be punished because our district cannot get people back to work in the building. And then yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that that's the reason why this isn't been able to to go. I could I I I didn't understand Jeffrey's question. Tom, could you repeat it? Sure. Um, I have it off the top of my head, but I can re find it too. It, basically, he's asking if we can go back to the volunteer program again, um, like we were considering before Thanksgiving, uh, with the understanding or assertion that um, part of the reason it was canceled was because of the p fear of COVID uh, spike after Thanksgiving, and uh, given that we're past Thanksgiving now and past Christmas and past New Year's, um, would we reconsider the volunteer position because we may not see another spike as a result of it? Is that why it was canceled, John? I, I think I just showed a graph earlier that the active cases are continuing to increase in the community. Yeah, so yeah. May I piggyback on that, Chuck? Yes on that volunteer program, the piggyback to that is the concern was that there were too many 
um, too many volunteers coming into the building. So there was a modification that could work with that where you have, um, you limit the number of parent volunteers and you increase the amount of days. So you say, if you're willing to be a volunteer, you need to commit to five days or you need to commit to six days. And then you cut down the number of people actually accessing the building. And that coupled with people who um, are interested in that position as a job um, could help you get up to, to, to the required satellite numbers. Thank you. Uh, and is there another one to another? There is another comment and then we actually have two emails as well. Um, so the comment that's out there, Marianne Downing, 13 Heather Drive, is the decision about whether or not to try to change the high school to an eight day a month model versus current four day, if lucky, going to rely primarily on survey, survey data. Is it going to be based on faculty willingness to go along with it? Kids, parents, kids and parents, of course, realize the high school they're going to is not what it was before. They've had the small taste of how it works, even in a few days of in-person learning they have had. They know it is different, but it's still better than just four days a month. As further perspective, my grade 10 cohort eight student is in the first half of the alphabet. It's going to get just one in-person day in the month of January. Okay. And then um, I'm just the, going. Do you want to read the emails too, Chuck, or, I, or wait I'm for later? Going in. <clears throat> I wasn't in the email, uh, so if you want to start, yeah, I'll, I'll read one. I just I'm logging on now. Okay, uh, I'm starting with the mo the oldest one, uh, Colleen Griffin. Um, hello, can you please tell me when the school committee meetings are scheduled to return in person? Uh, she's in math department, Reading Memorial High School. I think some of us would be willing to go in person. Um, I think that the challenging question we have is open meeting law and engagement from the public and pre-registration of joining a public meeting and other things along those lines. Um, I'm happy to work to figure that out myself personally too, but that's the challenge we face. Uh, the one from uh, Eric Panucci, uh, can, you, can you speak about the Reading Teachers Association? Where do they stand on remote versus in person? Can you speak of the amount of teachers who have taken a leave of absence? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure that we've, uh, I mean, that given them a question as to remote versus in person, and I don't have the data in terms of the leave of absence. I don't know whether John, you do? I, I do not have it off the top of my head. We have had leaves of absences this year. Yeah. Um, I, I'll say again what I said earlier. There are logistical issues that we're going to have to try to figure out, which is why we're meeting with staff and administration. Yeah. Thank you. Chuck, I have one more just quick statement just to clear things up from my perspective or from others' perspective of, of my stance. Um, in no way, shape or form am I trying to um, suggest that the administration is ignoring or um, not willing to admit to emotional or social emotional issues um, in any way, shape or form. Um, John and the the advisory team, the, the principals, everybody's that, that's been a, a top focus. Um, I just what I was trying to convey uh, and I think what Carla is trying to convey and perhaps what Aaron's trying to convey is it's hard to you can't see in in some cases what the parents are seeing um it doesn't mean you don't care you absolutely care you wouldn't be in this profession if you didn't care right you absolutely care um so in no way shape or form am i trying to convey that or or in any any negative connotation i'm just trying to uh express the urgency from a, a parent perspective that we get them more opportunities to see their peers and it is different um, but it is um, still very much uh, a positive when they have a chance to go in. So I'll just stop there. As someone who works at the high school, I just wanted to add that the um, all of us who work there are very concerned too. We're concerned about all the students and their their um, social emotional health. And we've actually been working as a district team, all of our nurses 
social workers, guidance counselors, our um, coalition representative, our adjustment counselors, and our behavioral health coach. Um, we've met weekly, and we're we're really concerned about this issue, and we're trying to make sure that we're prepared to support the students that we're trained, that we identify resources that we can use um, to um, help our students. We know this is not an easy fix and something that's going to go away even once you know things improve and um, the pandemic is better. Um, we, we will have the repercussions from this ongoing. And so um, as a group, we, um, we recognize this and we hear um, your concerns and we have the same concerns, um, all of us who work in this way in the district. So please, please, please know that. And we, we really want to work with all of you and all the parents to make sure that we are supporting our students. Thank you, Mary. Yes, thank you very much, Mary. Uh, Sean, did you have or is that an older one? Must be an older one. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, John, did you have the last couple slides? Sure. So I've been trying to uh, end with some positive celebration type things on all my presentations. Um, I really want to give a thank you this weekend. I did say it a little bit earlier, but I, I want to emphasize it again to the staff that, that came in this this week to work with our highest high need students. Um, these are students that cannot access remote learning. They cannot sometimes even um, work well um, setting where there isn't structure and there isn't the ability to to have adults support them. These are students that may be online, but they're just looking at a screen and there's nothing going on there. Um, these are our most fragile kids in preschool and in our programs at Birch Meadow and at Wood End. And I just want to say thank you to those staff both the teachers, the paraeducators, Kelly Boswick, Joanne King, Julia Hendricks, all of the related uh, service providers who came in this week um, to work with these kids um, so that they could continue to get the services that they need. So that was my thank you for this week. I do have some pictures of students. Um, this week we're going to highlight Birch Meadow Elementary School. Uh, they have been working on a project on PEACE, uh, P-E-A-C-E. -E. So we have some, some nice pictures of students and staff, uh, how they would define PEACE. The student here, PEACE is kindness, helpful, fun, love, happy, and play. This is a teacher. This PEACE is calm, quiet, and love. PEACE is life. Here's our school nurse at Birch Meadow and our school secretary, Peace on Earth. Another peace is love. Peace is happy calm. So thank you. That, that is my update. Thank you, John. So that. <clears throat> That was the uh, conclusion of the agenda. Uh, did anybody else have anything? Is there a motion? Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Tom? Aye. John? Aye. Uh, Aaron? Aye. Carla. Aye. Sean. Aye. Chuck, aye. Thank you, everybody, and thank you to all the presenters tonight, and uh, and thank you, Linda Engelson. Best of luck. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night.